Hello, David Diga Hernandez here. You're watching Spirit Church on Encounter TV. From where have demonic beings come? The answer may not be exactly what you believe it to be. Today on Spirit Church, I'm going to be addressing the origins of demonic beings. And I want to warn you, this view today contradicts tradition and contradicts what most believers believe about the origins of demonic beings. This week, Stephen Moctezuma featured a different worship leader. His name is Omar Lopez, and he's here to worship along with you to his original worship song, Everything. Here's Omar Lopez. And deep within me, my heart says your name. And deep within me, my heart says your name. Deep within and deep within me, my heart says your name. Oh, and deep within me, my heart says your name. I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything, Lord. I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything. Everything and deep ways in me, my heart says your name. Deep God, when deep ways in me, my heart says your name. I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything, God. I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything. All of me, Lord. I want to give you everything. Oh, I want to give you everything, Lord. I want to give you everything. 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 As I said at the top of the program, I'm going to be contradicting a traditional view. This view is that fallen angels are demonic beings. Now, I want to say that though this is a traditional view, it is not by definition a biblical one. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the angels who rebelled with Satan became demons upon the earth. This is an assumption we make because we believe that there are missing links in the scripture. And so people will make the leap from the angels fell and rebelled with Satan all the way to, they are now therefore the minions that are doing his bidding within the earth. Now, where this belief originates is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9. We talked about this on the last edition of Spirit Church, where I was specifically talking about the fall of Satan. This is what the scripture says there. This great dragon 
the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with his angels. Now, this is the one verse that causes people to believe that the angels that rebelled with Satan became the demonic beings that Jesus describes in the New Testament and that we are commanded and gifted and empowered to expel from individuals. Now, I'm going to give you first three distinctions between fallen angels and demonic beings. So I'm going to make the case that demons and fallen angels are two separate entities or creatures altogether. And then I'm going to tell you where I believe the scripture tells us demonic beings come from. So looking at demonic origins, we have to first distinguish, because of the traditionally held view, demonic beings from fallen angels. So, number one, the first distinction between demons and fallen angels is that demons need bodies. That's number one. All throughout scripture, you'll notice that demons are constantly seeking to possess vessels through which they can work. In fact, they seem to be very uncomfortable outside of a physical body. This is what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 8, verses 30 through 31. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance. So the demons begged, if you cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. This, of course, is a story where Jesus was casting a legion of demons out of a demonic man, and those demonic beings begged Jesus that he might use his authority to cast them into a herd of pigs. Now imagine this. They are so uncomfortable outside of a physical body. They so desire a physical body that they beg to be thrown into a herd of pigs. There's something very needy about demonic beings. They are parasites. They are seeking a place to find rest. In fact, they seem to be very tired outside of a physical body. And in a physical body, as we see in the same story where Jesus cast a legion of demons outside of a man, they seem to gather strength, supernatural strength, when they possess a human being. Now, fallen angels, on the other hand, have bodies. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 4 says this, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. And the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now some say that this verse in the Old Testament is not referring to supernatural beings, that this is referring to maybe a distinct group of people in the earth referred to as the sons of God. However, in the Old Testament, you'll find that the term sons of God never once refers to a mere human being. Always in the Old Testament, the term sons of God is referring to a supernatural being. Also, as we're going to read later, you'll find that God punishes the sons of God for coming in unto the daughters of men. Now, some people say, well, it's quite possible that this was just a people group that was forbidden with procreating with another people group, and therefore God punished them. But the punishment was very severe and supernatural in nature in that there were chains that were counted against those who fell into this sin. And third of all, it doesn't make any sense that men who produce with mere women would produce giants. Why was it that this offspring came to be gigantic beings? men of renown. In fact, as we know, demonic beings desire to be worshipped, much like their origins, which has to do with Satan who desires worship for himself. They are men of renown, and they are counted by the ancients as gods. Now, as you study ancient history, you may find clues of this, especially in the old ancient writings of different civilizations, or even hieroglyphics, where these hieroglyphics are describing these great gods that came down to the earth. Either way you look at it, this is supernatural in nature. There is no way or no reason that natural procreation should produce such giants, nor is there any reason to believe that natural procreation should result in a supernatural punishment. So, some say that these sons of God, as I said, weren't angels but they were mere human beings, not just because of the reasons I gave, but they'll cite verses like we see in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. They'll cite verses like this. 
For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. So some people will say, well, the angels, as Jesus described, never get married. But does that mean that they don't have physical bodies? Does that mean that they are unable to procreate? Certainly not. In fact, procreation, as it goes with angels, has nothing to do with marriage. Marriage is something that God instituted among the human race. So angels do, in fact, have bodies, as we just saw in Genesis, and as we also see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. The Bible says, Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. In other words, angels appear to be human. And they can only appear to be human to the physical eye if they have a physical, human-like appearance. Also in Luke chapter 24, verse 4, we see that the angels standing at the tomb are described as men. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. Now we know from other accounts of the gospel that these two men are angelic beings. Also consider the men of Sodom who desire to procreate with the angels that visited Lot. Here in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1 and verses 4 through 5. That evening, the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting there, and when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Then he welcomed them and bowed with his face to the ground. But before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city and surrounded the house. They shouted to Lot, Where are the men who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Now, all of the angels described in Scripture that came unto men are described in physical form. They have physical bodies, whereas demonic beings are never described physically. They're only described through their activity in people. So angels have physical bodies, and demons, by contrast, desire, desperately desire physical bodies. That's distinction number one. Distinction number two Demons wander the earth. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. So here again we see, just on a side note, that demonic beings, when they've left their vessel, become very tired. They seek rest. They are drained of strength. And they are desperately searching, wandering the earth, looking for a vessel to possess looking for a vessel to inhabit. So demons wander the earth. By contrast, we see that angelic beings have the ability to move from heaven and earth. And in between, they go back and forth. We see an example of this in Job chapter 1, verse 6, where the scripture says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, there it is again, the Old Testament reference. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now, I'll give you a few good reasons to believe that fallen angels, and not just the holy angels, were counted among those who came to give an account to the Lord. And I'm going to base this off of the fact that Satan himself came to give an account before God. So it stands to reason that if Satan, who himself is a fallen archangel, has to stand and give an account before God periodically, then so do the fallen angels who went with him in the rebellion. So first, note that the devil was no longer called Lucifer. In this scripture in Job, he's called Satan. So he's in his fallen nature. We know it because he's called Satan. Second, we know the devil in his, is in his fallen state in that scriptural reference in Job because the scripture says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. What did he desire to do to Job? Steal, kill, and destroy. Third, this account of Job takes place after the flood. How do I know that? Job chapter 22, verses 15 through 16. Hast thou marked the way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood? Now, it talks about the foundation being overflown. Now, that foundation is described in the scripture as being destroyed, is when the fountains of the deep broke open. So this account of Job is definitely after the flood, so we know Satan was in his fallen nature. 
We also know Satan was in his fallen nature because he desired to steal, kill, and destroy. And we also know Satan was in his fallen nature because the best clue, I think, is that the Scripture describes him as Satan and not Lucifer. So if Satan, a fallen archangel, has to stand before God and give an account, then it stands to reason that fallen angels were also among the others who had to give an account before God during that time. Now, therefore, angels, both fallen and holy angels, are not bound to earth. And in contrast, demons, when they go out of a, a, a vessel, that unclean spirit is forced to wander the earth. Number three, demons are called devils and unclean spirits. Angels are not. Now, when referring to fallen angels, the New Testament scriptures do not use the terms demons or devils or unclean spirits. Instead, the Bible makes reference to fallen angels by simply using a negative description or a negative context. For example, let's look at these verses here, and these verses are clearly describing fallen angels. But I want you to notice that not once in any of these verses do you see the word demons, devils, or unclean spirits. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's a portion of that scripture. Jude chapter 1 verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto dark, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It does not say the devil and his demons. It does not say the devil and his unclean spirits. It does not say the devil and his, and his unclean devils, as the King James Version would describe demons. Instead, the scripture in the New Testament attaches a negative context or a negative description. So, as we just saw here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the scripture says, For God spared not the angels that sinned. So we know that these angels that sinned are definitely not among the holy angels. They're just counted as the fallen angels that sinned. Now, this is also an interesting side note. This, I believe, is referring to the sin that we read of in Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God came in and procreated with the daughters of men. And we'll show you why I believe that was in just a little bit. We're going to get a little more detail. But on a side note, someone asked me, Brother David, when do you believe hell was created? I believe hell was created sometime after Genesis 6. Because the first sin was the rebellion against God in heaven, and the punishment for that was being banished to the earth. The second sin was the procreation with the human race, and that resulted in hell. So God, I believe, in, to some, in some sense, had given them a second chance. They rebelled, were kicked out of heaven, and they were to live under the subjection of man, the dominion of man, but instead they further rebelled, and so God had no choice but to cast them into outer darkness in chains into everlasting punishment, unto the great day of great judgment. And by the way, hell is different from the lake of fire because hell is cast into the lake of fire. Whole different lesson for another time, but let's continue to move on. So referring to the holy angels now, Paul describes those angels as from heaven. Here in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, the scripture says, Although if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than the one we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So Paul is basically saying, look, we're preaching the gospel to you. Don't believe the gospel no matter, uh, don't believe the false gospel no matter who tells you to believe that false gospel, even if it's an angel from heaven. So he's saying even if it's one of the holy angels as opposed to one of the fallen angels. So angels are angels. They're either fallen or holy angels, and the Bible will give them either positive context or negative context, positive description or negative description, but it does not call them demons, devils, or unclean spirits. Now, okay, we went the, through these three distinctions. Distinction number one, demons need bodies, angels have bodies, or fallen angels have bodies. Distinction number two, demons wander the earth, fallen angels can go to and from the heavenly realms to earth. And three, demons are called devils and unclean spirits. And angels are given just a negative context or negative description. Now, on a side note here, the scripture describes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And I'm going to be talking about this on the next edition of Spirit Church, on the rankings of hell. I believe that demonic beings are the wickedness or the darkness in the earth, and the fallen angels are spiritual wickedness in high places. 
And we're going to get into that on the next edition of Spirit Church. By the way, everything you're hearing, and we're going to get into a moment right now where I believe demonic beings come from. So if they're not fallen angels, what are they? But before we get into that, I want to take a quick note here to tell you that this is all from my brand new book, 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. This book, I believe, will help you to understand the spiritual realm and the true dynamics of spiritual warfare. Some people get into superstition and they make you really paranoid and they go into places where the Bible does not go and they, they do a lot of speculation and it just gets very weird. And then others are a little too skeptical of how demonic beings are able to work with in the earth. So I avoid both the extremes in my book, both extremes of superstition and skepticism, and we find true spirituality in the center because of what the Bible says. So I encourage you, you can actually get that book now. You can order it now. And if you do so, right now our ministry has an offer. If you watch this after October 4th, 2016, that offer is gone. But right now, you can get it at our ministry website. You're going to get free shipping. I'm going to sign it for you, and you basically just pay for the book itself. And everything you purchase from the book helps to go toward the gospel and funding the gospel and everything this ministry does. Okay, so where do demonic beings come from? Or from where have demonic beings come, as I like to put it in the correct phrasing? Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Let's go back to that verse. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now recall, again, I mentioned this just a few minutes ago, that Satan and his angels rebelled against God and were punished by being sent to the earth. But there was a second punishment that took place that we read about in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Let's read that verse again, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now think about this. Some people say, well, Brother David, when the angels rebelled against God, obviously that's when they were cast into judgment. And I thought that's odd because they rebelled. They had to have rebelled before the fall of man. This means they had to have rebelled before Genesis chapter 6. And if the demonic beings and Satan or the fallen angels all came about before then, and it doesn't make any sense in Genesis chapter 6. Because if the fallen angels had been thrown into hell, had been chained in darkness, they could not have been present in Genesis chapter 6 to commit the second sin. So this verse in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 is by no means describing the punishment for the original rebellion. Because again, that doesn't make any sense. If they're chained, how are they in Genesis chapter 6 committing the second sin? It's not possible. So this means there are two different sins and two different punishments. This is not a contradiction. So the rebellion against God, punished by banishment to earth, Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, and the procreation with human women, punished by chains of darkness, 2 Peter 2, 4. This is not a contradiction. Jude chapter 1, verse 6, again, let's read that. Here's the, another description of that same punishment. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the day of the great judgment, or the, unto the judgment of the great day. Now, why did the angels do this? Some speculate that it's possible that the fallen angels had noticed that their ranks were lacking in comparison to the armies of heaven. And because their ranks were lacking, they sought to procreate by rebellion and create new soldiers that they could use. So maybe the fallen angels came in to procreate with human beings so that they can create men of renown or these strong and mighty beings for their use in another rebellion that they were trying to form against the Creator. That's one possibility. The second possibility that I've heard, I actually hold to, and I believe this. I believe that the fallen angels came to the earth to procreate with the human race for one reason. They wanted to pollute the DNA of mankind. Now, why did they want to pollute the DNA? 
They wanted to pollute the DNA because it was prophesied that the seed of Eve would crush the enemy. They were preparing, just as God was, for the advent of Christ and the salvation of mankind. They were working against the will of God in the earth. And they saw that eventually the seed, the Son of God, would come and deliver all of humankind and subject all of the kingdom of hell, which is Satan, fallen angels, and demonic beings under mankind, under God again. Now, somebody told me there is no such thing as the kingdom of hell. It's true that hell is a place of punishment, but we nowadays use the term to describe the kingdom of hell as something that is descriptive of anything that is not the kingdom of heaven. So the scripture calls it the kingdom of darkness, and in terms today, we understand what kingdom of hell is referenced to. But still, these angelic beings, these mighty angelic beings that had fallen, were trying to pollute the bloodline of Christ. They were trying to stop the seed from coming through. And you have to imagine, this is absolutely wicked. God did not create demons, because some believe that if fallen angels are not demons, that God created demons from nothing. I actually had someone comment that on, on one, one of my articles that I did on Charisma. They, I had written about this, and we didn't give the second part that I'm about to give you. But I had talked about how angels and demons are different. And somebody's conclusion for some reason was, well, you know, if fallen angels are not demonic beings, that means God created demons, and therefore God is evil, and it couldn't be. And I thought, there's another option here. God did not create demonic beings. Fallen angels and man did together. Think of how evil this is. That rebellious man and rebellious angels came together to give rise to a new hybrid of evil. The likes of which had never existed before. That's heavy. That is demonic, literally. That man was so rebellious, man was so wicked, that he accepted the offerings of the fallen angels, the proposal to join in union and give rise to some form of evil. Half man, half fallen angel. Now, at this point, because of how wicked it had become, this is why the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. That's Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Do you realize that the verse before this, or the, uh, just a couple verses before this, is the whole description of everything that we just read? Verse 4 is when the sons of God procreated with the daughters of men, and the very next verse begins to describe saying, I'm grieved that I ever made man. He saw the wickedness of what they had created together. And he saw that the bloodline had become polluted. God brought the flood out of mercy. Had God not brought the flood, those men of renown, whom the ancients called gods, the ignorant called them myths, but the Bible calls them demons, these men of renown, these strong giant beasts, half man, half fallen angel hybrids, these creatures, God saw that they existed. God was grieved that they had come about. This is why God destroyed the world in a flood. He did not want that to continue in the earth. 
it truly did pollute the DNA. And so he did away with these false gods who desired worship, who men did worship. They were men of renown. And again, I believe this is the description of the ancient gods that are worshipped in hieroglyphics and in ancient accounts and records. These are those false gods. And so God wipes them out with the flood. How many were in the earth? I don't know. First of all, we know a third of the angels fell. We don't know how many angels there were to begin with. And then we don't know how they procreated, and we don't even know how many are still active. On a side note here, we don't know what fallen angels are still at work in the earth. Every New Testament reference that I've seen, and again, I've seen some that could be referring to fallen angels, but I don't really see that they are so. As far as what I've studied and the way I view it, every New Testament reference to fallen angels is past tense or future tense. We're talking apocalyptic imagery, something that happens in the end days. So I believe that the work of the fallen angels in the earth has either completely ceased or has come to a dramatic slow. Now we know the devil is still in the earth because the Bible tells us to be sober and vigilant. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In Revelation chapter 9, we see a future reference to fallen angels. And this is describing a demonic being or a fallen angel named Apollyon. And he releases something from the depths of darkness, something from hell, I believe. And I believe what he releases on the earth is that group of fallen angels that had been chained unto that great day or the day of judgment. So I believe at some future point, these angels are going to be re-released upon the earth. And I believe they're going to procreate again. Now I'm getting into very deep things here. They're going to procreate again with the human race. And that's why the Bible says that the last days shall be like in the days of Noah. That's what I believe that connection is. But again, I'm not dogmatic on these things. These are just some very interesting things I've seen and observed. Now, getting back to this flood. We understand, now that I've kind of gone over this, why it was so important that God wiped them out. So we know where people who are redeemed go when they die. They go to heaven. We know where the unredeemed go when they die. They go to hell. Or some believe that they go to some form of hell until the day of great judgment. Whatever your eschatology is, there's punishment and there's reward. And then we know that fallen angels, they're reserved for hell. But where does... A half-man, half-fallen angel go when its body is destroyed. I can't imagine that they have a spirit that goes to heaven or hell or a soul. And I also can't imagine that they are punished like the angels. There has to be some in-between. I believe that demons are the disembodied spirits of the offspring of men and angels. The fallen angels procreated with humankind creates the Nephilim, the giants in the land. The Nephilim are destroyed in the flood and their spirits, their souls remain upon the earth. Their souls were destroyed in the flood. That's why they desire bodies. These men of great strength, great renown. What happens in the New Testament when a demonic being possesses someone? They gain great strength. And that, I believe, is the origins of demonic beings. That demonic beings are the offspring of rebellion. God did not create demons. God destroyed the bodies of those Nephilim, those men of renown, and they remained upon the earth, and that is just absolute wickedness of the highest order, and hopefully that gives you a greater understanding of why that God had to judge. Now, this is going to conclude that lesson. I don't really see a point here to pray other than that God would continue to give you peace and understanding, because I know when you hear these things, it's very heavy. Now look, I already know what I'm going to get comments on this video. I don't really care. 
but I want to explain this to you, those of you who are sincere in asking questions. And you can ask questions. Feel free, ask questions. And let me tell you this. Nothing is more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people say, oh, you should just preach the gospel. And I believe that. But there are also times where we teach the word as it goes with these things. And these are questions that people have. And the reason I'm telling you this is so that you can understand that God is a just God. That things that have happened, especially as it comes to the demonic realm, is not because God is evil and He created these demonic beings because He wants to test us. No. Demonic beings are the result of rebellion, the joint rebellion of men and fallen angels. And when you understand that, it gives you a greater appreciation for the goodness of God. Now, I'm not, I don't think you have to believe these things to be saved. This is not central to the salvation message. And my message will continue to be the gospel. This is something we teach to believers. My primary message is the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation through Jesus. But this is something I felt in my heart that I wanted to address because I know there are those of you who watch this that want the deeper things. If you feel a lack of peace, if you feel uncomfortable with this, just understand this, these deeper things are for those who have gone deeper in the Word and they can handle the meat. If you're uneasy, you're uncomfortable, you, you feel a little nervous, I understand whenever you talk about demonic beings, people start becoming afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. And I want you to know that all you need to know ultimately is that Jesus loves you, Jesus died on a cross, and Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus rose again on the third day, and that if you put your faith in Jesus, you'll be saved. Everything else is up for debate. So I just wanted to give you those thoughts, but I want to pray with you now that God would give you peace and understanding. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one watching right now, Lord, who's hearing this message, and Father, who finds it difficult to receive. Lord, we pray that you'd give peace to their heart and mind. And I pray also, Lord, that those of us who have received this, that we would keep these things in its proper place and not let it become our central focus, not let it become our obsession. But Lord Jesus, that our gaze would remain fixed upon your countenance in the name of Jesus. Amen. Even Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons obey you. Instead, rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. In other words, salvation is more important than spiritual warfare. So have peace. And I know there's some of you who disagree, and, and that's fine. We're all family here. And if you disagree, let me know in the comments. Maybe we can learn together. Okay, I'm going to get to the comments in a moment. I'm going to read them all. And then stick around, I got a special announcement I want to tell you about. But first, I want to take a moment to welcome the brand new members of the Spirit Church family. There you are up on the screen. There are your names from different countries, different states, from all around the world. We love you. We are praying for you. We appreciate you joining the Spirit family. And we hope that you will find that community is helpful and prayerful. And as you leave your comments here, we pray with each other and continue to respond to those emails, those those of you who get those emails from Spirit Church, respond to them uh, with prayer requests, with questions, and we will get to them. If you want to become a member of Spirit Church, then go ahead and click on the link that's just about to appear over my head. If you're not watching this on YouTube, use the information at the bottom of the screen to manually find how you can become a member of the Spirit Church family. If you are a member of the Spirit Church family, we ask that you do one of two things. Either one, sign up automatically to pay your tithes and offerings, but if you already have a church that you go to where you pay your tithes and offerings, pay your tithes and offerings there, but you are still a member of Spirit Church, then number two, sign up to become a $30 a month supporter. Okay, now let's go to the comments. These comments are left on the video, The Fall of Satan. So again, we're taking the next few weeks to go over spiritual warfare, demonology, and such. So here we go. Here's a comment from Alexis. Thank you for your commitment to sharing the Word of God. Your videos have been a blessing and very insightful. Well, thank you, Alexis, for watching us, and we appreciate that comment. Here's Michelle, who writes, Thank you for this powerful teaching. Satan takes great advantage of our lack of knowledge. Once we know, then we can take back what Jesus paid such a high price to give us. Thank you. Uh, I believe it's Adonata George, writes, That revelation of Satan shook me as well. My hand was clasped over my mouth for a while. If you want to know why she was so, so shocked, there's a tongue twister. If you want to know why she was so shocked, then go and watch that video, The Fall of Satan. It is a very unique perspective on why Satan fell. And I already know people are going to say, I ask, why did Satan fall? They go, because of pride. And why? Because that's kind of the cliche thing to say. But we get more specific than that. So go check out that video. 
Uh, Suresh Anthony writes, Hi, Brother David. Don't stop what you are doing. You are a blessing from God to us. God bless you and your family forever. Well, God bless you too, and thank you for watching Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. DG4827 writes, I'm truly enjoying this sound and wholesome teaching. I now have a new understanding of the fall of Satan. Can't wait for part two of the series. Well, I just did part two. I hope you enjoyed it. Polita White Kitten I don't know if that's really your last name, but that's pretty unique. Thank you for blessing us with another great teaching. I had wondered, what is the root reason of Satan being our enemy? And you help me understand it. I can't wait for next week's teaching. I also joined Spirit Church. Well, welcome to the Spirit family. We welcome cat lovers as well. To Oz Prophet writes, I love your sermon. You are one of my favorite evangelists. Well, I appreciate your viewership. And I appreciate your comment. Keep us in prayer. We need all the prayer we can get here at Encounter TV. Christabel writes, thank you. What a profound lesson as usual. I am blessed. Keep preaching the truth. S. Vermonter 101 writes, Stephen sings really good for this song. We've actually been getting a lot of feedback on that song. Stephen singing Come to the Altar. That's going to be released later this week. Every Wednesday, Stephen releases a brand new worship video. On this edition of Spirit Church, we featured Omar Lopez, and we're actually, you should be seeing this video being released on a Monday, and that means this Wednesday, you'll see that song released. He got a lot of great feedback, so be sure to check it out. Nanette C. writes, I love your teachings because when you read a verse, you also give an example, and that helps me understand the verse, God bless you and your family. Well, what I do when I teach my lessons, for the most part, is observation, illustration, application. I make an observation in the verse, I illustrate it with a story or an anecdote or a point or a statistic, and then I go into application, which is the hardest part to do, but I give you bits and pieces of things that you can take away and begin doing in your life immediately, and that's application. Well, those are the comments. I want to announce something to you now. We are going to begin weekly meetings in Southern California on Sunday nights. However, I need your help. We need a thousand new $30 a month supporters because it's not just weekly meetings. We are going to open what I believe is going to be called a miracle center. What we have here is a beautiful facility. We have a television studio. We have offices where our people work. We have a director's room. And we have a little bit of room where we can seat some people to watch during the broadcast. But what we want to do is open a facility that is centralized and that people can come to to receive prayer for healing. I want to have 24-7 prayer rooms that people can come to and receive prayer at all times. I even want to have a 24-7 prayer line where people can call in but we need a, a different facility to be able to host that. Here, we're a little bit limited on when and where we can use things. And then on top of that, we're also going to open that new studio. Uh, we're going to have in that studio a uh, section for studio audience where we can have people coming in every week and joining the services on Sunday night. Stephen will be leading worship. I'll be doing the teachings. You'll be able to come every Sunday night. We'll, we'll also continue, don't worry, to be doing Spirit Church just like this, but we're going to add to everything that we're doing weekly meetings. I'm not starting a church. I'm not stopping evangelism. I'm not stopping television. I'm not stopping books. I'm not stopping our miracle services that we do all around the world. I'm not stopping Spirit Church. We're going to do this in addition to everything we're already doing. So this facility is going to be a powerful center where the dominion of God can be, and I want you to help me get it done. So help us do that. We need a thousand new $30 a month partners. As soon as we get that 1,000 new $30 a month partners, I believe two months from that time, we can begin doing those weekly meetings. So do that today. Don't wait. If just 10% of our viewers, in fact, I think we get an average on Spirit Church right now, anywhere from three to 5,000 on the high end, 10, 15, 20,000 viewers per video. If everyone watching this, so this way you don't count yourself out. I want you to take this personal. If everyone watching this went right now and clicked on the link that's about to appear over my head and became a $30 a month support supporter, then by the end of the year, we could have this up and running. Again, keep in mind there's some time constraints. If you're watching this in September, then by the end of the year, if we get that thousand new $30 a month partners, we could have it up and running by the end of the year. Help us do that. Don't delay, sign up now. You've been watching these teachings. You're being blessed. Again, if everybody signed up, we would have it. In fact, it'd be over abundantly above. Help us get that facility, that miracle center that we want to open in Southern California. Trust me, Southern California and the United States and even the world needs a place like that. 
Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. I'm David Diga Hernandez. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Hey fam, Stephen Moctezuma here. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel and to share our content. I hope you're enjoying all the content that we're sending your way. In addition to David's teachings and ministry videos, you can also join me on my worship playlist where I release a brand new video every week. Thank you guys so much for watching Encounter TV. God bless.